everyone. The recording now is live in Yukon, Oklahoma. All right. So, woo. All right, I want to show you something before we get started here. We have a prophecy seminar conference coming to Yukon, Oklahoma. Uh, the Southwest Radio Church, which is famous for doing prophecies, they got a, a whole series for two days, September 16th and 17th. Uh, they're calling it the Oklahoma City Prophecy Conference 2022, but it's located at the Christ Church of Yukon over on Vandermint Avenue, Yukon, Oklahoma. So if you're interested in a prophecy, you might like to go to this. I noticed that they've got some really popular speakers. Uh, Southwest Radio Church is famous for their prophecy series. And they usually bring in some really uh, outstanding teachers that are conservative in their prophecy teaching. Uh, many of them are Southern Baptists. Uh, Mark uh, Hitchcock is one of my favorite teachers. And, He's a regular speaker for them, and um, I'm, I'm using some of his material right now as we go through our class. So if you're interested in, in knowing more about Mark, he's a pastor over in Edmond, and he's a, a graduate from um, the Dallas Baptist Seminary, and he's written about 30 books that are very popular books on prophecy, so if you're interested in that. Um, and I just want to make sure that for the next few uh, weeks and months, maybe, uh, every so often I'll randomly throw this up there to remind you. If you sign up now, uh, it's a free conference, but if you sign up now, they'll keep, they'll keep you informed on what's happening. So you might like to do that. All right, so um, before we get started, I want to uh, take a little bit of time to uh, prepare ourselves mentally, spiritually, physically, Make sure that you're right with the Lord. Uh, rebound if necessary. Private confession unto the Lord. And we'll get started here in a moment. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we have this opportunity in this great nation to be able to come together and worship and to uplift your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, that we get to go through this series in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it's a lot about the prophecy of the rapture. And today, Lord, as we continue our part two in the rapture series, I pray that it'd be interesting, enlightening, and also that we'd be able to apply directly to our lives some of the doctrines that come out of studying this um, foundational doctrine in Christianity. Pray, Lord, that you be glorified and lifted up in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're doing verses 13 through 18, but we haven't even gotten into those verses yet. We've just been reading them. And today, we're still not in them yet. Um, so we're going to be talking about the rapture uh, listings in the Bible, how many different ones are in the Bible. But to get started, I will read the verses 13 through 18, so we know where we're headed. And Paul said this to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. See, the rapture is a doctrine that we are to use to encourage each other. And yet, there's been a lot of discussions, debates, and even arguments about this doctrine. So, we started last week, part one. We said, look, our approach is going to be, first of all, be kind with one another. Recognize that even in this crowd that we have here, we have different opinions about the rapture. 
And last week, I gave you an informal survey. And for those who are here, I asked you to, to mark what you thought uh, about the rapture. And I wanted to tell you what the results were. And then, so you can see that even in our group here, we have different thoughts about it. So first of all, the question was, which of the following statements best describes your views about when the rapture will occur? So the first one, the rapture has already occurred. That's a view from preterism. And nobody has marked that one. So in our group here, we have no preterist. A preterist is a person that thinks that all the prophecies were fulfilled back in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. So uh, there are some that teach that. In this room, we didn't have anybody mark that or they didn't want to tell me. And that's okay. You, I will tell you right now, as a cybersecurity expert, I want you to have your privacy. Okay, privacy is important. All right. So uh, the second one, Christians will be taken up before the tribulation period that precedes the second coming of Jesus. This is known as the pre-tribulation view. And 13 marked that. That was the most a number that was marked. The next one is Christians will be taken up before the great wrath of God is poured out late in the tribulation period and precedes the second coming of Jesus. This is known as the mid-tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, there will be a taken away of the, the saints. And we have seven that mark that in our room. The next one is the rapture. And the second coming of Jesus are describing events that will unfold simultaneously or close enough together at the end of the tribulation. This is known as the post-tribulation view. And we have two that mark that. The next one is the concept of the rapture is not to be taken literally. We have one person said, I'm unsure about that. Unsure was one of the answers later on also, but for that particular one, the person wrote down unsure. If it's literal or is it figurative? The next one is none of the above. And we have two people marked that. And then we have, I'm not sure. Eight people marked, I'm not sure. And then there was two write-ins. The write-in one was, no one knows the day or the hour Two people wrote that down. And one was, only God knows. So you can see, even amongst ourselves, we have a diversity. And so as we study this, I told you earlier, we don't want to get into debates, arguments. We want to be kind and nice with each other and recognize that each of us have different reasons why we think this. And I told you also that oftentimes, when you get saved in a particular church, Whatever that church is teaching on prophecy is usually what you will adopt first. And then maybe later in life, you might hear some other things. You might, you know, discard what you first thought, or you may adopt some new thoughts. And I am actually, uh, I told you earlier, the position that we take in Southern Baptist Church, and my own personal uh, thoughts, is a pre-tribulation, pre-millennium. And we're going to go into what all these things mean over the next few weeks. So if you've never heard these terms, um, it might be a challenge to you. And so hopefully I can explain them well enough that you can understand them. But also I want you to get to the point where you study to show yourself approved and you figure out what you think about this. And not necessarily have to adopt whatever I say. And so with that, um, the survey was a good way for us to start off. I want everybody to recognize because oftentimes when you go to a particular church, you think everybody else in that church thinks the same way you do. And that's not normal. It's usually diversity is normal. Okay, so I want to make sure we all understood when we first start off. So that when someone asks a question, you're not over there going, oh, man. <laughs> you know, and getting all up in an uproar about a question that actually is good for us to ask in this safe area questions that maybe we don't ever get a chance to ask the pastor or somebody out in the big you know, room out there. So I want you to feel safe that you can ask whatever questions you want as we study this together. And if I don't know the answers, that's good because then I can go off and study some more and come back with some answers. So I oftentimes don't feel like I know the answers immediately. 
But I will tell you this. I know how to find answers. Okay? So I am really good at that. So, all right. Well, with that, um, we're going to uh, start off with the multiple raptures in the Bible now this week. Did you know that there are multiple raptures already listed in the Bible? Okay, how many of you remember what the word rapture means? Yeah, the, the snatching away, the being caught up, being forcefully pulled away. And actually that word harpazo occurs 14 times in the New Testament. But only four of those are the literal God took someone off the planet. All the rest is maybe something like Paul was caught by the guards and dragged away. And the harpazo means that also. He was caught and, and pulled away. So see, that word has different meanings. depends on the context of how it's being used. So I don't want you to think harpazo always means being caught off the earth to the heaven. It doesn't always mean that. It just means a, a catching away, a grabbing by force and being pulled. Okay, so we're going to see all the different times it happens in the Bible, though, with people and um, how God has used it to teach us more about that doctrine. All right. So first of all, the doctrine of the rapture. Um, this is a concept that appears in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You may not be aware of that. The very first place that happens is in the book of Genesis. And then the last place that happens is the book of Revelation. So we're going to see each of those as we study. So the idea about being caught up by God is not limited to this letter that Paul is giving us in Thessalonians. It's throughout the Bible. So I want to make sure that you start to think that way. That it's not just limited only to what Paul is teaching. All right. There are several places throughout the Bible where people are snatched up, caught up. Okay, and from, from the earth to the heaven. And the problem, though, is that all Christians believe there will be a rapture, but we don't all agree on when or what the timing is. When does it happen? Or even what happens when it happens? So we're going to study the scriptures and find out more detail about when, why, and how. And so, because of that, uh, we're not going to be in a rush to get to the fast answer of pre-trib, which is my answer. No, we're going to build on this and figure out what are the doctrine about it. What is it being taught by the church? The church being like the founding fathers of the church. What do they think? And modern times. And also some of your favorite pastor teachers. They may have different thoughts about it. We want to see what those are. And last week, I gave you a, a list of the pastors I like, and they're pre-trip pastors, Chuck Swindoll, folks like them. But we're not going to bring up their names again for a while. We first want to see some scriptures. So the first thing is that word rapture. Okay? We told you last week that word comes from the Latin word, raptus. It means to be snatched up, caught away, to be carried off by force. And the Greek word is harpazo. And if you have a strong concordance, you want to look it up, I give you the number. It's number 726. So you can start to study this word out yourself. And it, I told you earlier, it's used 14 different times in the Bible. And four of those times are actual raptures by God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about the dead and living. We're going to study about Philip. You know, Philip was raptured. You guys know that? He was snatched off the planet and moved to another location and then placed back on the planet. So we're going to learn about that. That was fascinating. Paul. Well, Paul had a really weird experience. He don't know if he was in his body or out of his body. We're going to, we're going to read that one also, what happened there. And also, the book of Revelation talks about the man-child that was caught up, which is Jesus. And we're going to talk about that. And there's other events that happened. But let's start first with the Old Testament. So what I want you to do is you're going to go to Genesis. And the first one we're going to talk about is Enoch. Enoch, his name in Hebrew is Henoch. Henoch, 
means a founder, and it means the beginning, the, the first one. And isn't that appropriate? He was the first one that was raptured. <laughs> He's the founder. And we will see here shortly that the first record of the event is Enoch. And Enoch, by the way, is mentioned in the Bible six times. Well, a little bit more than that. He's mentioned six times in Genesis, once in a genealogy in 1 Chronicles. He's mentioned three times in the New Testament. So we're going to get to some of those so we can see more about his life. And um, some of you may even have heard a book called The Book of Enoch, which um, it's not a canonical, it's not a, it's not a Bible book in our Bible, but you might be surprised it is officially in the Bible for the Ethiopian church, the Christians in Ethiopia, they have the book of Enoch in their Bible. And uh, so that's uh, interesting, uh, but it's not normally in our Protestant Bible. And, but the book of Enoch, I have been studying now for almost a year uh, with another pastor. Uh, I do it by podcast. And um, some of the prophecies, like in the book of Jude, it has a quote about Enoch prophesying about the coming of the Lord. And that's taken straight from that book called the book of Enoch. It's quoted straight from that book. So it's not canonical, uh, meaning it's not part of our holy scriptures. But it has some stuff that we can learn that are interesting. I won't spend any time teaching about that in this class. But just letting you know that is a book that if you're interested, you can go get a, a copy of it. And that's usually called the first book of Enoch. Then there's a second book of Enoch. It's just a made-up book. Now, the first book of Enoch, we know that it's authentic. The essence um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had copies of it in there. Uh, so it's several uh, thousand years old. But anyways, what we find out about Enoch is, first of all, let's go to Genesis chapter 5. So let me turn to my Bible here. Genesis chapter 5. And starting at uh, verse 18, it says, When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. By the way, Enoch then would be the seventh generation after Adam. So seven generations is Enoch. And it says here, um, And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years had other sons and daughters, all together, 962. I have a, I have a three-volume book at my house. Three volumes. It goes through all the genealogies of the Bible. All the genealogies. Every single person, what was about them, what their lives were about, what their names mean. There's a whole study of that. And when we get to Enoch, something special happens. So let's read that in verse uh, 21 here. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Do you guys know who Methuselah is? The oldest man who ever lived? Yeah. Do you know what his name means? So Enoch named him Methuselah. Methuselah means when he dies, it will come. So can you imagine having a kid? You named him. When he dies, it will come. And all the other children in the neighborhood don't want to throw rocks at that kid. Okay? <laughs> don't want nothing to happen to him because when he dies, something bad's going to happen. It's going to come. Well, what the it was was the flood of Noah. Okay? Uh, Methuselah. All right. So, yes. Yeah, we're getting to that too. Yeah, so I'm on 21, you're at 24. All right, a fast reader. Yeah, so we see here that after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And 23 says, altogether, Enoch lived 365 years and Enoch walked with God and then he was no more because God took him away. So let's, uh, let me bring up some slides on that. And so we see that he's the seventh from the, the sign of, from the line of Seth. He's a father of Methuselah when he was 65. 
And then we find out that when he was 365 years old, the scripture says in verse 24 that he walked with God. The word here for walking with God is the same as Adam walking with God face to face. He knew him personally. He walked with God. Not only that, but there's one other person in the Old Testament that walked with God also. It's Noah. Okay, so we have, uh, well, actually, I skipped over person. So I said Adam walked with God. We all knew that. Did you know that Abel walked with God? Abel walked with God, then Enoch, and then Noah. So we got these famous people in the Bible that walked with God, literally walked with God. And he did it for 300 years. Then something special happened. He walked with God and he was never seen again because God took him away. And the word here for being taken away, let's go on to that. This is just fascinating. So we see he walked with God and he was not. Means he was translated. He was removed. Not He didn't die. He was just removed. He was no more. Isn't that odd? Suddenly, he's not visible anymore. No one can see him. They don't know where he's at. He's gone. Not only that, but how did he get gone? God took him. So we have this word, enenu. Enenu means to be translated, to be moved. And then we have lakwak, which means God took him away. He snatched him. If you were to use the the Hebrew translation into Greek, it would be that word harpazo. He harpazo. He snatched him away. Why? Why was Enoch taken away? What do you all think? Say it again. Okay, so you think maybe to save him from the darkness of death. But the Bible says it's appointed to all men to die. Spiritual death. Yeah, there's, there's, before Jesus, everybody got saved. Okay, let's, let's make this clear. Everybody gets saved in the Old Testament the same way you get saved. You believe in the promise of God, of his son. They all are saved by grace through that promise by faith. And certain types of revelations were being given to them. But like Abraham, Abraham says he was, he was accounted righteous because he believed in the promise of God. And you're believing in the promise of God that's past tense. They believe it in the future. Jesus, Jesus always existed. Jesus has always existed. So, but what's different though is that the price of sin was not paid for until Jesus. So we're going to get to that later. But right now, for Enoch alone, see, we're all trying to add our Christian thoughts to this. Did you notice that? Immediately we jump to modern day Christianity and we're trying to add Christian talk to this. Think like a Jew. How does a Jew see this? Methuselah's name is the he to why God is doing this. Methuselah, when he dies, it will come. God walked with Enoch, and God decided it was time for Enoch to be taken off the planet. We'll, we'll let you ponder that a little bit more. Here's another translation. God took him to himself. If you're reading a modern Hebrew translation, it could be saying something along those lines. God took Enoch to himself. All right, let's, let's see if we can uh, get a little bit more insight. Let's go to Jude. Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse 14. Okay, I don't have my Bible all marked up, so I got I to gotta thumb through it just like you do. Jude, which is right before Revelation. So it's way in the back. It don't have any chapters. Okay. Jude verse 14. Jude 14. I will read it for you. And my Bible says, 
Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. And those men that they're talking about, some bad people who are, in the, in, in the last days, there are going to be some horrible people. And some bad pastors, some people who are wolves, dress up like sheep, and they're false teachers, and, and people who don't love each other. And it's just really horrible. You start reading Jude, and you're getting very, very depressed real fast. Well, he says here, the ladies, yes, the ladies Bible study is teaching through the book of Jude. Oh my gosh. God bless you guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But, but see, this is, this is in the Jude book, but this is a prophecy from Enoch. Enoch said this, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly ways, and all the harsh words of ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He has a lot of ungodliness in there. All right, so there's a prophecy from Enoch. Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam. And Enoch sees into the future and says, the Lord is coming back and he's going to judge. That was long before anybody knew anything else, right? So, you know, when we start looking at this as Christians, we have to kind of pause ourselves for a moment and think of it. What's the Jew doing with all this? The Jewish people are like, whoa, the Lord's coming back with judgment. Thousands upon thousands of his angels with him. We'll get to that in a little bit too, because we also come back with them. But we'll, we'll see that. So we see that there's a prophecy here. Well, Enoch is actually escaping that coming judgment. The one that is the flood judgment in the time of Noah. Ponder that for a moment. Enoch is taken away before the judgment comes. Now, there's a thing in the Bible called a doctrine of first events. When something happens for the very first time, it sets a pattern, and you can learn from that. So we have doctrines based off of these patterns. And one of the doctrines here is that this is a pattern that God, when he walks with his people, he will not let them go through judgment. They won't get the wrath of God. He'll take them out of that. Now, what's interesting here is, wait a minute, Noah went through it. Noah had, you know, the ark. And Noah went through that. And uh, so if you are a prophecy student, you might be thinking something along the lines of this. Okay, so we're the church. We walk with God. He takes us out of the judgment. The judgment comes, the tribulation. And the Jewish people, he protects them and brings them through it. Kind of like Noah and the ark. But anyways, we'll get to more of this later. But I'm just kind of planting some seeds for you to start thinking about these patterns. Because there's more of these patterns as we get into it. So here's a case where Enoch is taken away. Yes. Oh, the dates. Wow. I don't have them written down here, but I do have those dates. Um, 300 years later, we have Noah is being told what to do. And to prepare. And Noah has 120 years to get ready. So I'll show you a little time chart maybe next week then. Because there's, there's a relationship here. So as you, was it right before? Yeah, when was it? So we have, I'll get out those, that's why I got those books on the genealogies. Because it shows the genealogies of when everything happens in a big timeline. I don't know if you know this, but if you take uh, the, the names of the children of Adam through Seth, each one of them in the genealogy for the first 10, because then we have the 10 nations that come later. Each name is a prophecy of the coming Messiah also. And if you translate it into English, I'll bring that next week too. I think you'll find that interesting. That goes along with the genealogy and the timing. We don't know the day or the time when the Lord will come back. So the person who wrote that in was accurate. But we do know some doctrine and we have some seasons. So we'll get to that. Also, the calendar that God has given us 
the, the Jewish calendar has a lot to say about uh, when God is doing different things throughout history. So maybe later we can get a chance to do some Jewish studies on the calendar. That'd be fun, the feasts and all that. All right, well, I'm getting sidetracked, it's so easy. When you do a study like this, it's easy. So Enoch is the first one, start thinking about that. He's rescued from the judgment coming. Who would be the next one that you can think of that got snatched off the planet by God? Elijah, that's the very next one. So let's go to Elijah. Elijah's name means my God is Yahweh, or my God is Jehovah. This is, the, the four letters are the Hebrew letters for God's name, and most people have forgotten how to pronounce that. <laughs> because it's, uh, they don't have vowels, if you notice that, they're consonants. I'm taking a course right now, I've been taking the class almost over, a little bit over a year, and on Hebrew, and I'm like, yeah, how would you pronounce that? <laughs> and the professor says, he's not going to. Uh, he's, he's a traditional uh, rabbi who doesn't pronounce the name. He will pronounce it as Hashim, which means the name. Hashim, okay? He would, when he came across it, he would say, my God is Hashim. My God is the name, is how he would look at that. Whereas we, we just say Yahweh or Jehovah. We put letter... Uh, out, um, vowels in there. All right. So anyway, so Elijah, his God is Jehovah. You know that uh, this is interesting. Go to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings. Oh, we're eventually going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2. But 1 Kings 17, it tells us who this man is. He's a prophet from Tishbe in Gilead on the east bank of the northern kingdom of Israel. I've always wondered, why does God do that? Why does he say the details like that? This man is from this little tiny village on the east bank of Israel. Because we find out later that a lot of things happen in these little villages. And God has given us precision. If you were here this morning for our pastor talking about the same thing, God is very precise and gives you the exact location of things. And if you are really smart as a Bible scholar, get out of concordance and look up each of these little places and find out what happened there. And then ask yourself, what does the name mean? And when you start to learn their names also tell you more, you're like walking away going, whoa, God has a perfect plan. It's all making really good sense. But we don't have time to go into all that this morning. Yeah, the archaeologists using the Bible found, they discover things all the time. Um, all right, so what happened, though, with uh, Elijah is he got into a big spiritual battle. He was fighting against Baal, or Baal. And King Ahab is the king of Israel, and he went off and married Jezebel. And we all know the story of Jezebel. She's like, you don't want to name your kid Jezebel. Okay, yeah, it's, it's not a good Christian name. But Jezebel is a priestess under the Baal worship, which are the false uh, religion. And it tells us in 1 Kings that Jezebel got mad at him, decided he was going to, you know, they were going to get in a big fight. And um, she, she sent all her Baal priests to go after him. And... At this time, Elijah was filled with the Spirit. Elijah said, yeah, come on, come on, let's do it. And so he decided to have a big contest. You guys know that contest? Where he says, my God is greater than yours. And he piled up a whole bunch of wood and then more wood. And then he poured on top of it basically petroleum, oil, gasoline. All right. And he says, Bill, can you light that fire? And you priests of Baal, can you pray for him to light the fire? Get it started. And they, all day long, it wasn't just, you know, okay, we're going to try this for 30 minutes. No, they did their worship, their dancing, their loud screaming and yelling and everything, and nothing happened. And, you know, Elijah, he's pretty arrogant. He goes, maybe your God is sitting on the toilet. 
It literally says that in the Bible. Now, see, we get that toned down in church. In church, they won't say that. But if you're reading the Hebrew Bible and you come across it, he was not very nice to them. He was very crude. And so I don't know if you guys realize this, but a lot of times in your Bible, in the original language, there's crude things in there. God uses normal, everyday language. We clean it up. We clean it up a lot. So he finally says, all right, that's not enough. He dumps gallons and gallons and gallons of water on top of it. And he prayed once, asked God. And Jehovah said, I personally think it must have been a meteor because it came flaming down, hit right smack in the center of that pile. Just, it was so explosive that it killed the priests of the Baal worshipers. There was something like 7,000 of them. I have to go look it up. All right, but there was a lot of them. They, were, they, they got killed by this. Well, Jezebel got mad and she says, I'm going to kill you. And she came after him. And at that point, after this big victory, you think that, hey, Elijah should have a good time. No, he got scared. He got afraid. He was scared for his life. And the Bible says that he ran away from Jezebel and he hid in the caves out in the desert. So big man of faith he is. After all that, he ran away. Well, God says that um, he called Elijah and said, Elijah, I want you to go and anoint another man, another prophet, your successor. And most people will pronounce the successor's name, um, what, Elisha? Elisha? Yeah. And uh, so you have Elijah and Elisha. It gets real confusing. So I heard my rabbi uh, teacher, he pronounced it differently. Elisha. Elisha. So I said, oh, like a girl's name. <laughs> and so we have now the case of Elijah anoints Elisha in 1 Kings 19 as his successor. And you know what they did? They trained schools of prophets for 10 years. Schools of prophets. And they, they train him in four different cities for 10 whole years. So he's training this guy to be his successor. And then something powerful happened. Let's all turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Wow, there's a lot here. It says here in verse 1, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven... In a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgad. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. And anyways, they begin this conversation. He keeps on trying to tell his successor, stay here. God's telling me to go over there, but you stay here. And this guy says, I'm not staying here. Wherever you go, I go. Why? There's something special about to happen. And so you notice what it says here in verse 3. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord's going to take your master from you today? And he says, Yeah, I know that, so shut up. <laughs> Literally, that's what it says also. Shut up. <laughs> and, and mine's toned down saying, Don't speak about it. <laughs> All right. So that happens three times. Three times, Elijah is going to go to another town. And three times he tells Elisha to stay there. And Elisha says, no, I'm going with you. And every time they get to the other town, a bunch of prophets came out from their school. And the prophets all say, Elisha, do you know that the Lord's taking your master away today? And every time he says, yes, I know that. I know. Shut up. Stop telling me. All right. So this is a special day. Something's going to happen weird. And all the prophets all know about it. So we get down a little bit further here. Oh, look at, at verse 7. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. And this is where he takes his mantle, and Elijah hits the water, the water parts, and they walk across, and they leave those 50 back there. They're not coming with him. But the 50 are watching. They see everything happening. 
So what's about to happen was seen by everybody. It's, it's going to be shocking. So we get a little bit further here and look at verse 11. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and fiery horses appeared and they separated the two. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the, the chariots, the horsemen of Israel. And it says here, and Elisha saw him no more. Elijah went up into a whirlwind and was not seen again. Wait, you got to face me. I skipped a verse. Yeah, I skipped the verse. <laughs> He stayed with them because he's wanting. Okay, so Elijah says, all right, you got one last promise I'll give to you. What is it? And Elisha says, give me a double portion of your anointing. And Elijah says, hmm, well, that's going to be kind of hard. That's going to be really difficult. But I tell you what, if you're with me when God takes me away, then you can have it. And so what happens is when Elijah is being taken away, he drops his mantle. And the mantle floats back down, and Elisha picks it up and puts it on. And then he also takes it off later and uses it to open up the river. And, and it, we end up having double the miracles in Elisha's life than what was in Elijah's life. He got double the portion. So he's staying there because he wants that blessing. But he's staying there also because he knows that something's going to happen. He wants to see it also. Imagine that. Now, this is a lot different than Enoch. Enoch was taken away because basically uh, Enoch was uh, rescued from the coming judgment. But Elijah, why was Elijah taken away? What's up? What's going on? He was tired. Which one was tired, God or Elijah? <laughs> All right, so what's happening here is Elijah has done everything God told him to do. Now, sure, he was scared. He hid in the cave for a while, but then he came back out, and he went ahead and trained these other prophets. He's got successors. He's got, you know, the, the kingdom is growing with these prophets, and God is now going to reward him. He's going to be rewarded for all that work that he was doing. God's taken him away, and we're going to find out later that uh, Elijah does something really special with Jesus. You guys know that story? The transfiguration story? Yeah, we might get to that in a little bit or in a little while. But, but Elijah shows up in Jesus' time. So we're going to see more about that. But in the meantime, just so that you can see this, the word here, the Lord took him. It says it, it, it took him up. So he was taken up by a whirlwind. And that word for the taken up, if you to put that also over into Greek, is harpazo. He's, he's being snatched away. He's being caught up in a whirlwind. Of course, if you're into UFOs, you say, no, that was a UFO that picked him up. You know, I've seen that a whole bunch of times. I saw this NASA article of all places they had this drawing of what they thought this will within a will looked like and this whirlwind and this fire. And see, there's a fire, there's a whirlwind that happens with every rocket. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, God can do whatever he wants. But it's interesting to think about the technology of flaming chariots with flaming horses. Wait, you mean there are horses in heaven? If you're a horse person, you probably already knew that. Okay. Fiery, flaming ones that fly? Yes. All right. There's all kinds of cool stuff in this Bible. All right. So let's go a little bit further now. And notice what happened here. Oh, well, you, I, I ought to read it a little bit further for you. Those 50 men, what, what happened? You want me to show more? You want me to show more? Show a little bit more? Took them up in the air. You want a little bit more? These men, these 50 men, went to Elisha and said, where did the Lord take your master? He says, 
Don't worry about it. And they said, no, where? It got to the point where he was ashamed. He was embarrassed, it says. He was embarrassed because they kept on pestering him over and over and over. Don't you want to know where he's at? He finally said, all right, you go look for him. You're not going to find him. Because where is he? He's in heaven. You're not going to find him, but go ahead and look. You know, when the Lord takes us away, it's going to be seen. And people are going to say, where did they go? What happened? And don't try to find us because you won't be able to find us. But anyways, uh, I think it's interesting that these guys were all standing around saying, where did he go? Well, the Lord took him up. It's kind of like Jesus. When Jesus went up on the ascension, he went up into the clouds. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, where did he go? And the angels had to tell him, get on your job, man. You know, stop looking up in the heavens. But anyways, we go a little bit further here. So what theologians will teach you about this particular one is that rather than escaping the coming judgment, it appears to focus on Elijah's example as being blessed. He's getting a reward now. And so uh, both of these patterns, the reason why a lot of people will teach you that the, uh, the church will be taken off the planet before the judgment, but also there's a reward that we're getting. And you guys know that you're going to go to the Lamb's Supper, big wedding feast. You know that you got the Bema seat, which is a judgment seat for rewards, not a judgment seat for punishment. It's for rewards. So all that takes place. But anyway, so a couple patterns here. It's quite interesting. Uh, let's see here. Oh, we only have about two minutes left in this class. Yeah. I'll introduce the New Testament, and then we'll pick it back up next week. So the New Testament. Seven raptures are recorded in the New Testament. So you just now got two from the Old Testament. Enoch, Elijah. There are seven listed in the New Testament. So your homework assignment is see if you can find them. Yeah. You, see, if you have the handout, you can find them much easier. I tell my students all the time, it's an open book exam. Okay. <laughs> If you got the handouts, you got the answers. So read them up this week. Come back next week. Be ready to discuss it. Okay? Any questions before we close? I hope you enjoyed the review of the Old Testament and looking at a couple of saints and beginning to think, oh, that's, I hadn't thought about that that way. All right? Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would bless us with our study this week as we go home and look up these seven that occurred in the New Testament, and that we will be excited and ready to discuss it next week. In Jesus' name, amen.